सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर सर गुड मॉर्निंग एम आई ऑडिबल सर 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 एम आई ऑडिबल टू यू सर गुड मॉर्निंग एम आई ऑडिबल सर टू यू सर इन जूम जूम रे आपण मत सुनी पण ना ते जूम मीटिंग रे सर सर जूम Sir, good morning. Now, am I audible to you? Sir, hello, sir. Sir, we cannot able to hear you, and I think uh, like. Sir, you are not audible. Sir, you say mute, mute, no. Mute, 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 Sir, now also we cannot able to hear you, sir. Sir, we cannot able to hear you. Call you on Zoom. मीटिंग <laughs> 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 कहीं ना 
Sir, good morning. Sir, mute ra chantiya pala. Unmute yon. Okay. Haan. Thank you. Yes, sir. Abo mujhe suni parle? Haan, sir. Everything okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Haan, sir. Haan, sir. Very good. Abo mujhe kaun pare kudiyo? Mujhe talk ta apna mujhe screen share hi thiyo chahiye. Mujhe screen share hi kachi na. Mujhe screen share kori ni. शेयर है ना हाँ हाँ सर देखा है ओके ग्रेट Good morning, everyone. I welcome all the participants, the resource person, faculty coordinators for the AACT Atel sponsored online faculty development program on quantum computation and information science between 4th to 8th Jan 2021, organized by the Department of Electrical, Electronics and Communication Engineering, Geetham, deemed to be University Bengaluru campus. In this morning, I welcome all of you for the first session on challenges and progress towards physical realization of quantum computers handled by Dr. Colin Benjamin, National Institute Associate Professor, National Institute of Science, Education and Research, School of Physical Sciences, Boneshwar. I now take the privilege to introduce the resource person of today's session, Dr. Colin Benjamin, Associate Professor, School of Physical Sciences, NISA, Boneshwar, India. Dr. Colin Benjamin secured the first position to win the gold medal during his BSc Physics in BJB College at Kull University, Boneshwar, in the year 1997. He did MSc Physics from Atkal University, Boneshwar, in the year 1999. He continued his learning to receive his diploma in advanced physics from Institute of Physics, Boneshwar in the year 2000. He has been awarded PhD in electron transport and quantum interference at mesoscopic scale in the year 2004 from Institute of Physics, Boneshwar, India. Dr. Colin Benjamin worked as postdoctoral research fellow in France and UK from 2004 to 2007. From 2007 to 2009, he was a postdoctoral research associate for his research on quantum simulations in University of Georgia, Athens, USA. He is the author of the book titled Electron Transport and Quantum Interference at Mesoscopic Scale. He has published more than 75 research articles in various international journals. 
Dr. Pollan has supervised more than 10 research scholars. He has been granted funds for four research projects from DST, Government of India. He has also received awards like Young Scientist Award, Research Day Award from Germany, and ICTP Research Visit Award from Italy. At present, Dr. Colin Benjamin is working as Associate Professor, SPS, NICER, Boneshwar, India. We are proud to have you for this FDP, sir. We welcome you. And hereby I hand over the session to Dr. Colin Benjamin, Associate Professor, School of Physical Sciences, NICER, Boneshwar, India. Welcome you, sir. Thank you very much. Professor Panda for the very kind introduction. So today's, uh, I will straight away go into today's talk. The title was given to me by Professor Panda. She asked me to give a talk on challenges and progress towards physical realization of quantum computers. So I will base my talk uh, with the following outline. So this would be the outline of my talk. So what is the current state of play? What are the quantum computers which are available uh, to work on? Uh, who are the leading countries involved? And a little bit of the history, how mankind starting from the technological inventions of the industrial age has reached here. Uh, after that, I will go into the nuts and bolts of understanding what are these quantum computers and how they come into being. I will give you an introduction First, a little bit of the postulates of quantum mechanics, then the operator formalism in quantum mechanics. And then I'll go to some basics of quantum information and the application, uh, one of those main important application in quantum teleportation. I know that some of this may have been covered, but uh, for the understanding, I would uh, cover it in short. Um, and finally, I'll go into how to build gates and circuits. I will give a detailed example of one of the gates which I was involved in, that is the graphene Josephson qubit. So most of the quantum computation platforms, they use superconducting qubits. Of course, there are other platforms like ion traps and uh, photons also, but we will be concentrating only on superconducting qubits. And I had the privilege of uh, proposing one um, type of superconducting qubit, that is the Josephson qubit based on graphene. So I will uh, uh, concentrate on that which I know best and other uh, superconducting qubits which we will come across uh, during this talk are basically different different versions of the fundamental uh, this uh, superconducting qubit which I will discuss and finally I will concentrate on what are the challenges uh, taking uh, superconducting qubits and gates that is decoherence and uh, how to overcome this challenge and that is via error correction. So this is the basic outline of the talk. So let's start. Okay. So mankind and it's a, a twist. Uh, so how to put it uh, with the technology started basically from the industrial revolution. So the industrial revolution, you know, happened somewhere in Britain. It was fueled by cheap energy that was coal. And it led to fundamentals, uh, fundamental breakthroughs in transport, especially the James Watt developed steam engine, the locomotive, the train. So people could go freely from one place to another. So transportation of people led to fundamental breakthroughs in other avenues also. But the first and foremost was coal. Coal was very cheap. So that led to iron and iron people could um, uh, manufacture and um, uh, uh, process. And that led to fundamental breakthroughs also in textiles and in mining and metallurgy and other things. And most important players during this competition. So most of these uh, technological inventions have also spurred competition between countries. And during those times, 1760 to 1830, the two main players were Britain and France and their colonies. Britain had its colonies in Africa and India, and uh, France also had its colonies in South Asia, Africa, and both of them were trying to capture power in Europe. So after this, the first phase of industrial revolution and during this phase of industrial revolution, this technological developments which happened in these countries also came to the colonies which they were uh, governing. So we had the trains coming to India in 1850s, late 1850s, something like that. Uh, next with the second phase of industrial revolution, 
that happened uh, in the latter part of the 19th century and that was fueled by two things the communication technology of telegraphs and telephone alexander graham bell's famous invention of the telephone and then it was spurred on by edison's electric bulb so electricity combined with trains then telephone and telegraph means this was the fundamental breakthroughs in the first and second revolution industrial revolution which we are still uh, having them with us and of course in physics maxwell and faraday developed electromagnetism <clears throat> and the main players during this time were europe and then america came up so you have this edison who was american developing electric bulb so america joined the technological uh, bandwagon and was a competing power along with europe for modern technologies uh, a very important event also happened during this time was that japan defeated russia russia was a european power till then asia was considered a backwater on um, for technology technology was really the preserve of the europeans and and uh, americans to some extent so japan in 1905 uh, defeated russia in the russo japanese war and japanese technology started uh, coming into fruition uh, so japanese um, inventions in communication in telegraphs in telephone in electrical um, uh, manufacturing they came into the uh, fore and then we also had einstein writing his very four famous papers in 1905 <clears throat> after that uh from the point of view of technology we have the age of science which i which i say is the age of science people call it in different names this was a period between the two world wars 1914 to 1940 so during this time what happened this was in time this ford uh this ford motor company started its um, mass manufacturing of cars and then aeroplanes right brothers discovered the aeroplane and aeroplane oil petrol there was a boom in uh, um, transport via cars and other trucks and other things and also aeroplanes and other things and then medicine antibiotics and then radio and television came into the picture also as far as technology is concerned in uh, europe mary curie and all discovered radioactivity bragg discovered crystallography which we can <coughs> <coughs> sorry <coughs> find out the structure of molecules and all and most importantly for us since this is a quantum uh, information quantum computation uh, seminar is the birth of quantum mechanics in 1925 that was the famous picture of x solve they used to have this quantum information uh, quantum mechanics conferences and all the legends are there you have einstein you have planck you have uh, all the big shots of that field there this was the solve conference of 1921 and the, again the major players in this contest over dominance about the technological dominance of our radio television antibiotics whatever you have were europe and asia then comes the period of the second world war what happened during that time well during that time uh, we had the war between the allies and the axis powers and that was uh, that came to a head actually for who can control the atom bomb the development of a a uh, warhead which can kill millions was a technological invention you may say that it was a very bad thing to happen but still then it was a technological invention and uh, heisenberg from the german side was leading the research efforts while on the american side it was oppenheimer and all of those <clears throat> other physicists including niels bohr who were leading the efforts to develop the nuclear bomb and of course america gained first mover advantage it tested its nuclear bomb first this was the trinity it was tested in 1945 and then it um, very sadly was dropped on hiroshima and nagasaki in 1945 so from the technological age of industrial revolution we moved on to uh, <clears throat> the age of science and developments in quantum mechanics to the atomic age so now we are still in the atomic age i would say with major developments happening and major competition between the big powers and which are the big powers during this time it was the axis powers and the allied powers the allied powers won the second world war because of their um, um access to better technology in shape of the atom bomb but after the war the other allied powers like the european powers like england and france they became very weak it was mainly a contest between usa and ussr and if you see the nuclear um, 
power, which were after the Second World War, it was the Soviet Union, which did its nuclear test in 1949. China did its nuclear test in 64. And after, oh, and of course, after Chinese nuclear test, there was a test ban treaty and all. But by then, China had already tested. India tested in 1975. And then again, we have this, our neighboring country, Pakistan, also testing in 1998. So all that now, de facto nuclear powers. And of course, uh, the competition during this new, for this nuclear bomb was uh, between US and USSR after 1945. Then comes the space age. The space age started with USSR launching Sputnik, which was the first satellite in 1957. And Yuri Garin went to space in 1961, and that rocked the US. Uh, they said that we are lagging behind the space race. We are behind Russia. What we are going to do? So that <clears throat> that spurred innovation in among the Americans, and they launched the first man on the moon mission, and that was uh, fructified in Neil Armstrong uh, walking on the moon in 1969. And in the space race again, just like we had the industrial race, the technological race, were fueled by electric bulbs and all, then the atomic race. The space race also had USSR and USSR, USSR. Uh, being the major powers. They were fighting for control of space. Of course, later China, uh, we in India and Europe, they all came together. But of course, the space race has evolved. Space race no longer is just a competition. It has developed into cooperation. So if you see the International Space Station, which was launched in 1998, is an example of major cooperation. And uh, very recently, China in 2007 uh, developed uh, anti satire sat -miss missile, which could destroy a satellite orbiting in space. So that was a fundamental breakthrough in technology that China achieved. So many other countries have this anti satellite missile, <clears throat> but that was the <clears throat> first public demonstration of it. Okay, so from the industrial revolution, we have come to the uh, space race via the atomic race. Now we finally come to the quantum race. So the quantum race that was <clears throat> got a massive uh, boost when the first experiment to show quantum teleportation was launched. So that experiment was done by the Jian Wai Pan group in China and was published in a Nature article in 2017. And what they showed was that quantum teleportation, till then, the best record of quantum teleportation was over 143 kilometers from one place uh, somewhere near Switzerland to another place somewhere in Austria. And this was done by Zeilinger Group, and that was published in Nature. And that was around 143 kilometers. That's a very good um, demonstration. And that was over optical fibers and all. Now, the space to Earth quantum teleportation demonstration was over 1400 kilometers and uh, from some uh, stations uh, in Tibet, the Chinese could teleport information of a qubit to their satellite, which was uh, which is called Micius, M-I-C-I-U-S, um, that it was traveling, orbiting the Earth at a distance of 1400 kilometers. So that was a quantum leap in quantum communication. So we have the telephone, the telegraph, which were uh, major uh, breakthroughs in uh, communication, to now, which is quantum communication coming into the picture. And of course, that led to um, real uh, heartbeat and uh, danger signals in America. They said that China is taking the lead now, just like the Russians took the lead when they uh, put the first man uh, on the space, Yuri Gagarin. So China has already taken the lead. So they um, uh, got into this effort of quantum computation and quantum information in a big way. And uh, very recently, uh, from I think 2015, 2016 onwards, we see major companies uh, in America launching quantum computers. So these are basically machines which can do some <clears throat> kind of quantum computation uh, uh, tasks, which can establish quantum supremacy. So what is quantum supremacy? What are qubits we'll understand later. But just to suffice that these can do things which quantum, classical computers will take ages or even millennia to possibly do or can, may never do it actually. 
so these are the tasks which quantum computers can do in very short periods of time so the first uh, launch was by ibm the initially the launch five qubit then they allowed people to log into those systems and work small small programs on it it's called the ibm quantum experience but the most um, recent processor which they have the ibm has is called the hummingbird uh, quantum experience Uh, I'm getting some chat messages saying that the talk is not fully visible. Sir, uh, sorry for the interruption, sir. Sir, the font the increase for me is the percentage. It has. Oh. Sir, the arrow mark is on the right side. Re. Right side. Okay, oh. right side. Ah, no. it's. Ah. Sir, it has the arrow mark. ले उट <laughs> Um, what are the different types of quantum computers available now for people to work on? So the first one was by IBM, as I said. They initially launched a five qubit processor, and now they've uh, gone above. And uh, most recent, 2019, was uh, around 53 qubits. And now I just 2020, I saw some paper which has some 65 qubits. And that you know, idea is to go up to around 1,000 qubits in three four years. Google, they have a Sycamore processor. They also have 53 qubits, and they first have shown that they could do a um, what is it called um, uh, quantum supremacy test. Rigetti, that's also another private concern that has shown 31 qubits. Now, what is common between IBM, Google, and Rigetti is that they are all based on superconducting qubits, and we'll discuss a, a single example of a superconducting qubit later. The next one is by Ion Q. Ion Q is a spin-off from University of Maryland. It's a trapped ion quantum computer, and that is 79 qubits. That's not a superconducting processor, but a different kinds of processor, and that has gone up to 79 qubits. And China, uh, this is the university system they have, and this is again Jian Wei Fan, that same person, and this is photonic technology. This is photon-based qubits, so this is not neither superconducting nor ion trapped computer. But this is photon qubits, and they have shown 76 qubit quantum processor. Um, but there are some problems with it. But uh, as I said, the major competitors between uh, in this uh, quantum race are the US on one and China on the other. So US with five eyes. So five eyes is that security network which USA has with the UK. Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. So these five countries, they have a very um, strong security network. Their spy agencies work together, and this is mainly versus China. Although I have to say, Russia is also a major player, and it has also uh, some breakthroughs in uh, quantum computer technology, which we are not aware of really, because many of these technology, quantum computers, and all are classified technology. uh so whatever you see in archive preprints and publications is not the whole story there is much more development behind that and uh, europe is also quite a major player in this uh, game so okay now what is uh, what what kind of quantum computers are there are they um, uh, extremely good i mean so you go to the market just like you buy a laptop or a Computer, desktop computer. Now, can you buy that? No, that uh, that is impossible. Now, we are still far away from that stage. So, these quantum computers are called noisy intermediate scale quantum. 
So, and the, the, they are known by this acronym NISQ. So these quantum computers all have between 50 and 100 qubits, and they may be able to perform tasks beyond the reach of classical computers. Some of the tasks will be what classical computers can do, and these computers can do within a shorter period of time. But most of the, um, but the real technological progress is that some of the tasks which they can do, a classical computer can never do. And why it is called intermediate? Because the range is around 50 to 100 qubits. And then why it is noisy? Because there is still not perfect control over the qubits. The qubits are still susceptible to what's called decoherence. We'll discuss decoherence later. That means, see, qubit, the most important property of a qubit is phase coherence. So you must have learned during the past few days. Now, these qubits, these superconducting qubits, they decohere in very short time, maximum microseconds or milliseconds. And during that short period of time, you have to implement gates and do some uh, quantum computation using them. Now, all quantum computers still now available are of the NISQ type. Most of these trapped ion and superconducting qubits are of the uh, NISQ type. Now, there's, there's a significant difference between superconductor-based uh, qubits and ion trap qubits. Now, superconducting qubit circuits are 1,000 times faster. These ion trap uh, qubits are very slow, but the accuracy of measuring the qubits is better for ion trap uh, quantum computers. So you can measure, get a readout of the results in much better fashion than from superconducting qubits. Okay, so the first one, uh, first quantum computer or this NISQ quantum computer we'll discuss is called the IBM System 1. Now, IBM System 1, we are left, you can see this picture. This is uh, Dario Gill. This is the IBM uh, um, chief there. And uh, this IBM com quantum computer is placed in some cage here. And it's a three feet high, uh, high and a foot wide quantum computer. Basically, it's a dilution refrigerator with miniature wires going around everywhere, connecting the superconducting qubits to each other. So they have around 50 superconducting qubits. Now what happens is microwave pulses trigger this qubit to action. They put them into a superposition of zero and one, and also they can manipulate them and couple them to form an entangled state. You must have learned about entangled states, which those states uh, two qubit states or multiple qubit states, which cannot be written as product states, these are entangled states. And the whole process, this whole um, thing is encapsulated in a dilution refrigerator and it is just above absolute zero. So it's around milli Kelvin temperature. This is not even liquid helium. Liquid helium is four Kelvin. So this is like milli Kelvin temperature. So very, very cold. So um, the, the, to say that we have achieved quantum computing is uh, of course right, but then these temperatures are so uh, cold, just uh, milli Kelvin temperature. So they're still basically in the labs. Uh, so IBM uh, launched its uh, quantum computer first with this IBM quantum experience, which was a five qubit device. And um, they put it in the cloud so that it's available for anyone. So anyone can write a quantum program so to uh, use these quantum computers, you have to write, write code in a little bit special way. Your same Python codes can work, but you have to tweak it so that it runs on a, a IBM Quantum Experience or other uh, platforms. So IBM Quantum Experience, I think, gives QI, QI, KIT some kind of a, a package which comes with Python and other uh, quantum computation platforms give some other uh, packages. So you can you install this package in Python and run these codes on IBM Quantum Experience. And a lot of people have run actually codes on them and got fruitful results. Now, there is a benchmark on, on how good these quantum computers are, and that is called the quantum supremacy test. And that describes the potential of quantum computers to drastically, drastically outperform classical. Now, IBM has not uh, at still not claimed quantum supremacy. They're saying that we have achieved quantum computer, but we do not uh, claim as yet quantum supremacy. Now we'll go next to Google and we'll see what they have to say on this. But they um, uh, claim that when we encapsulate our quantum computer in this dilution refrigerator and 
the this of course when we run it that leads to errors and to uh, measure how good our system is they launched a new metric uh, which is called quantum volume and this takes into account both the uh, number of qubits in their system as well as the amount of error correction needed to give get uh, um, uh, plausible output from your machine so we'll learn about decoherence and error correction later in the talk because unless you have error correction um, you won't get uh, suitable or uh, uh, results from your quantum computer which make any sense and according to ibm their quantum volume is doubling every year that means the number of qubits are increasing and the amount of errors they can correct that is also increasing so that's a sign that you have more control of your over your qubits and you have more number of qubits which you can couple and do useful work and these are some of the references uh, this is archive paper by uh, from the group this ibm is mainly by dario gill and j gambetta and all of those people so this is a very nice article and you can read them it's mainly discusses ibm uh, quantum computers but you can get a nice overview of the current state of play so later in 2019 itself google's uh, came into the picture with uh, the psychomorph quantum processor and they, they also are uh, superconducting qubits and they have 53 superconducting qubits and they said we have achieved quantum supremacy so that means that they could do a task which no other classical computer can do it but this quantum supremacy uh, was uh, challenged by the uh, people who are behind ibm uh, so the problem they designed so in the left you can see here is the uh, superconducting quantum processor of uh, google and this is also um, placed in a dilution refrigerator and it is uh, works according to microwave principles very similar to what the uh, ibm quantum computer does and um, this is also at milli kelvin temperature so very little to choose between them uh, as far as uh, quantum computation framework is concerned now the problem the uh, design was extremely difficult for a uh, ordinary computer what was the problem there was a random circuit which passes through all these 53 qubits through a series of random operations so what they did you can think of is the hamiltonian with some random uh, interactions so it's a completely random hamiltonian and they initialized the computer and finally after you evolve so it's a unitary evolution uh um at the final when you uh measure all the qubits you will find one of the uh 53 2 to the power 53 states you can so for example you have a 3 qubit uh quantum computer it can be in eight states so 2 to the power 3 uh two if you have a 2 qubit uh, quantum computer it can be four states 00011011 so if you have a 53 qubit uh, quantum computer it can be in 2 to the power 53 possible states so you will get a probability distribution of uh, when you repeatedly make a measurement or you if a system and make a measurement at the end you will get one of those 2 to the power 53 uh, probability distribution so the idea is how good any classical computer would be to check this probability distribution so when you make a measurement you get some probability distribution and in this some states of the um, uh, quantum computer will be more likely than others for example if you have a um, say a 2 qubit system you have zero some amplitude in front of 0 0 some amplitude in front of 0 1 some amplitude in front of 1 0 and some amplitude in front of 1 1 now they can be all equally probable in that case the probability distribution would be 25% 25% 25% 25% 25% or it could be that some states are more likely than others so there could be some states which are like uh, 60% some states which are like 20% some states which are like 10% 10% so in this uh, 53 qubit uh, uh, quantum computer when they ran they found that some of the states are more likely than other there is a probability distribution and using that quantum computer would check in around 3 minutes 20 second what was that probability distribution of the final states now to check this uh, via classical computer will take more than 10000 years because it has to run this million times 2 to the power 53 uh, states so that means a uh, hamiltonian of the order of 2 to the power 53 into 2 to the power 53 
So that is the dimensions of your matrix. And that is very difficult for a classical computer. So what was extremely difficult, it's a very uh, simple problem, but uh, they showed that uh, it's a proof of principle that there were compute quantum blocks. But of course, this was challenged by the IBM team. They said that if you uh, write a proper code uh, for this uh, job, then you can any classical um, um, powerful computer like the uh, they have uh, uh, at some place a uh, classical supercomputer can do it in two days or something. So whatever it is, even if it is two days, a classical computer with a different and better code can do it. Still then the Google quantum computer can do it in three minutes, 20 seconds. So this is a proof of principle that quantum supremacy works. <laughs> okay. Now, what about China? So I um, didn't talk about ion traps and uh, uh, the Rigetti quantum computer. Rigetti is also based on superconducting qubits. They have seen less number of qubits till now, 31. And that's also a uh, <clears throat> private concern. Now I come to China. Now China, as I said, by they developed and they shot an arrow through the uh, security establishment of US and UK that they could have quantum communication from uh, Earth to a satellite, which is 1,400 kilometers away. So that was a brilliant achievement by the Chinese. And what they showed was that quantum teleportation works. <clears throat> and not only that, they, but so because uh, Earth to uh, satellite is mainly free space, they could <clears throat> uh, mitigate any decoherence and errors. Um, and uh, also shown via optical fiber network, a uh, Beijing to Shanghai quantum communication framework. Again, same thing, quantum teleportation from Beijing to Shanghai and uh, the, that they have also shown. And of course, some quantum computation. So that uh, comes under the realm of quantum uh, uh, communication. But on quantum computation, very recently, because this 2020, I think it was September or October somewhere, they published in science this uh, Jiu Zhang, their quantum computer, to rival Google Sycamore and IBM System One using 76 photons. And they um, did a real uh, uh, algorithm, which was called optimal classical Gauss Bose sampling algorithm. And that would run 100 million times faster than what the current fastest supercomputer can do. And by this, they showed the milestone that quantum supremacy they, can, uh, they have achieved. Of course, boson sampling, uh, I don't want to go into details, but it is about bosons and photons and the probability of detecting a boson at a given position. And it's actually a very hard problem. It is more harder than a p-hard problem. Now, in p-hard, we know computational complexity are extremely hard for classical computers to uh, solve. <clears throat> but a quantum computer can uh, solve these n-p-hard problems. But the problem with the um, uh, Jiu Zhang or the quantum computer by the Chinese is that it has been designed to solve a single problem. The only single problem they can design is this uh, bo bos uh, boson sampling problem. They, they have to be again re-engineered to work and uh, to show results for any other computer program. So if you want to say test what Google Psychomore did, a probability distribution, over a arbitrary random Hamiltonian evolution. Then you have to again re-engineer those qubits and redesign the circuit and then to run that program. So that, that the prob problem is that it has to be reworked completely. It is not programmable as the Google Sycamore is programmable. So in IBM system, you can run any code <clears throat> or in uh, Google Sycamore, at least the claim is you can run any code, but for the uh, GNY PAN system, you can run only that specific code. And, but of course, they have shown um, uh, quantum supremacy here also. Okay, so now we come to the, so this is the current state of play. We have China and on the other hand, USA competing in this quantum race to build the quantum computer. We have seen that China has taken a lead as far as quantum communication is concerned. It has built a uh, satellite uh, to earth quantum communication networks. Basically the 
first uh, steps towards a quantum based internet <laughs> as far as quantum computers are concerned uh, the americans still have a edge but i think the chinese are fast catching up um i didn't say anything about developments in europe but uh, uh, on the cryptography side europe has also massively developed on the on the russians have also undertaken massive uh, developments uh, um, i I didn't talk of the contribution of the other five uh, eyes, as they say, USA, UK, uh, Canada, Australia, and uh, New Zealand into this. But Australia has also taken some lead in building the quantum computer. I think John Martinez, who was earlier with Google, has moved now to Australia and is working with uh, someone there to build a quantum computer. Okay, so now we are going to understand uh, some basics of quantum information and quantum computation. without which uh, i think we would be very difficult to understand the nuts and bolts of a quantum computer okay so till now any questions um, maybe i can see uh, the chat okay okay so i think you now it is all, the whole screen is visible right no no and it is not visible visible sir. sir you were telling about decoherence uh, can you explain it once again so no no, no so i will explain everything about decoherence later so this was oh, just okay, to okay. give a framework of what is a quantum computer so okay sir anything about I was just talking about the history and a yes, little sir. bit of the current uh, what is happening around the world. Sir, sir, superconducting qubits and ion trapped qubits. Can you uh, explain uh, it again? Uh, no, superconducting, superconducting qubits. I uh, I will uh, uh, deal with that later in the talk. Okay, I will okay, say okay. How by Josephson junctions uh, you can design superconducting qubits. Ion trapped quantum computers. I don't work on it. so i don't want to say something which will confuse you. but um, um, if you write to me i can suggest you some papers uh, where you can learn about that but i don't have much knowledge about the process of building a ion trap quantum computer but uh, quantum uh, this uh, josephson qubits uh, superconducting qubits i will deal with it because i have done it and i will uh, talk about that later in the talk Uh, yes, uh, please uh, share some papers related to the uh, basics uh, related to the super uh, super computing. Yeah, yeah. I, I will uh, in um, while I go forward in the talk, I will be uh, uh, dealing exactly uh, with uh, super conducting uh, qubits only. And uh, can you elaborate the issues you were talking about? The issues uh, came in. Uh, Uh, when the china uh, were working over there so will you elaborate it uh, later yeah, no, no, no. the these things on uh, the um, past what has happened i will not go back but we will understand how to build a superconducting qubit how to build gates from oh. the superconducting qubits in the part of the talk <laughs> thank you sir okay so um, what is uh, this talk about this talk will be about understanding quantum information and quantum computation and to understand quantum information and quantum computation we have to use a specific notation which is called the dirac notation so dirac notation is a convenient tool for representing vectors in quantum mechanics so you have your vector which is a column vector say with 0 and 1 and that is represented by the ket say 0 and the ket 1 represents a column vector 0 1 while the ket vector 0 represents a column vector 1 0 okay so using this and it's basically manipulation of uh, column vectors and matrices uh, what is uh, is this, uh, quantum information okay <clears throat> okay okay so postulates of quantum mechanics i don't know whether these postulates were covered but uh, very briefly we'll go into it so any physical system can be represented by vector in complex vector space which is called a hilbert space 
and do we know about the superposition principle if a1 a2 are two physical states of the system then a linear superposition of these two states with some amplitude c1 and some amplitude c2 is also a, a allowed state in the same hilbert space now what about observation if you observe a quantum state what will happen so when we measure a observable of a physical system let's say the spin of a physical system then we use a hermitian operator for that so here the hermitian operator is a the physical state of the system is this j and we get a eigen value j of the state j ket the j kets are eigen vectors which form an orthonormal set and serve as a basis for our vector space this must have been taught so i am not going into it for example i um, the sigma z matrix if you want to measure the spin of a particle uh, of a electron say so you measure say sigma z you will get the probability of finding it in the spin up or spin down with respect to the z axis similarly if you make uh, sigma x or sigma y measurement you will get a particular value for that measurement now to carry out measurements we have the born rule when a measurement is made the system collapses to one of the eigen states <clears throat> and that is represented by a hermitian operator measurements are measure, uh, uh, represented by a hermitian operator and you get the probability of measuring with this ket of j which is your state with the uh, uh, observable state a so one of the so the state the quantum state will collapse to one of the states of the observable so measurement leads to instantaneous collapse of, of a superposed state into an eigen state of the measurement operator <laughs> now how do physical systems evolve when not been measured so if you look at schrodinger's time dependent equation you can solve this if your hamiltonian is independent of time and you will see that the schrodinger equation evolves unitarily e to the power minus h t by h cross so your time evolution operator is unitary that means what that means if you do a reverse computation you will get back to where you started from and because of this built in reversibility quantum computers since they rely on unitary operators do not dissipate any heat if you see a classical operation it is seldom reversible apart from the not gate all classical gates they generate heat if you run any irreversible classical gate you can't get back the input from the output that is called irreversibility but from a quantum operator if you do any operation because it's unitary you get back the input from the output okay now von neumann postulated that there are two process of wave function change one is the probabilistic non unitary which is hermitian non local discontinuous change brought about by observation and measurement and then secondly there is a deterministic unitary and continuous time evolution of an isolated system that obeys the schrodinger equation so the thing which most confuses people is this difference between these two that measurement is a completely non unitary process it's non local and it's probabilistic you get one of the states or the outcome of the measurement with some probability you don't have no idea with what probability you will get but on the contrary when a system is not being measured it evolves completely deterministically you can point out where your system is at t this time and it is completely unitary it is reversible but the outcome of a measurement is irreversible so the just at one point the quantum computer is working perfectly well it is deterministic and it's unitary and it's evolving perfectly well in time reversible and suddenly when you measure it everything goes it collapses into one of the states with some probability and that's a completely non unitary outcome so how to reconcile these two complete two different paradigms for measurement and the second for evolution so that has actually mystified many people some people say okay it's a fact of life this quantum mechanics is like that but some people say which is this is the quantum uh, copenhagen interpretation you just keep your mouth shut because this works because this gives correct results therefore you just shut up and don't concentrate too much on the uh, 
difference between the unitary evolution and the non-unitary measurement. Okay. <coughs> uh, here are some more uh, differences between classical and quantum mechanics. So a superposition state is unique to quantum mechanics. Two classical states can be easily distinguished, say a zero or a one, but two quantum states, especially if it's a superposition, like say the polarization state of a photon, horizontally or vertically polarized, but if it is in a polarization here, H plus V by root two, which is 50% probability of being in a horizontally polarized state and 50% probability of being in a vertically polarized state. That is very difficult to measure. If you have a polarizer in the state HH, 50% time it will click, 50% time it will not click. Or if it's a polarizer in the state VV, 50% of the time you will click and 50% won't click. So it will be very difficult for a single measurement to distinguish whether the state was uh, zero, um, state was in a superposition or it was a classical state. So it's very difficult to distinguish classical state, uh, sorry, quantum states. But if you take a statistics of measurement, so you repeat the measurement many, 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 many times, then you get a statistics probability distribution. And from that probability distribution, we can make out which state your photon was in. So qubit, as I come to, so this is the uh, most ideal qubit we have. It is a, uh, in the logical basis of zero and one, which is also called the computational basis. So you can change basis, by the way. You can go from uh, the zero one basis to a diagonal basis, plus minus basis, and you can work perfectly well there also. But a qubit is an arbitrary superposition of a zero and one, a two classical states of what is called zero and one states. And you can have not just qubit, but a qubit. If you go to three states, zero, one, and two, and make an arbitrary superposition of those three states, you get a qubit. And similarly, you can go to qubits are D dimensions. And uh, uh, any outer product is a measurement. So you have psi psi, which is a matrix, which is a measurement. The inner product will give you the probability of some outcome. The basis states, as I said, you can have computational basis zero one or the diagonal basis plus minus. And these are equivalent basis for all qubits in 2D. The projection operators are that unitary operators. The projection operator projects your qubit into a classical state, while uh, unitary operators evolve your system from one time slot to another time, and they're perfectly reversible. <clears throat> and uh, one of the most important gates we will concentrate on is the Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate, when applied on a classical bit, like the zero state, will give you a plus state, an equal superposition of plus and minus. Similarly, the Hadamard acting on the one state will give you the minus state. So the plus and minus states differ only by a phase, but they are an equal superposition of zero and one. <laughs> what are the basic single qubit gates? So single qubit uh, gates are the Hadamard gate, which when acting on the zero states give you a plus or acting on one gives you a minus. The not gate, which is a classical not gate, acting on zero gives you one or acting on one gives you zero. <clears throat> and you can have, a, as I said, a change of basis from computational basis to a diagonal basis also. And do you have other kinds of gates which are called the phase gate. So you can apply, um, uh, apply this operator, this phase uh, operator on your uh, state and you get a different superposition of zero and one. So this uh, puts the zero and one state in a uh, superposition with a phase, which is e to the power i pi by four, this T gate. Now, two qubit gates will come across. Two qubit gates are uh, like the C0 gates, which are entangling gates. So if you have two qubits, zero, zero, and uh, you first do a Hadamard, you put the first uh, qubit in the plus state, the second qubit remains in the zero state, then you run the C0 gate, you get an entangled system, a maximally entangled system. So if you make a measurement on the first state and you find that the first the qubit is in the zero state, then automatically you can say that the second qubit is also C. So that, that's the meaning of a maximally entangled state. Okay, so just like a single qubit basis, we had zero, one. For two qubit, we have <clears throat> the computational basis, which is 
zero 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 one one zero and one one, or you can go to other basis. This is the Bell basis. Uh, equal superposition of any of these computational basis gives you a Bell basis, and another so, um, uh, basis could be the Magic basis. So uh, you can uh, work on any of these basis. And the most important thing is that any combination of this basis states should span the whole Hilbert space. And here I have given a simple circuit, which can um, give you some phases here. And then this is the Hadamard uh, operator. And then this is the C0, which when you are acting, say, on the 0, 0 state, will give you one of the magic basis states. So this, uh, a qubit doesn't have any uh, application whatsoever. A qubit gates will have some applications, single qubit gates like Hadamard, Knot, Clip, they have some applications, but to do something uh, useful, you have to have two qubit gates like the C0 gate. So you can entangle and work on those qubits and do some computation and show some results. <clears throat> so this is a qubit with gates as well as the C0 gate is called a quantum circuit. So this is a small quantum circuit we have shown here. It has two phase gates, one Hadamard gate and a C0 gate. A C0 gate works on two qubits, while Hadamard and phase gates are single qubit gates. So one of the most important applications is quantum teleportation. Uh, so I don't know how much time I should spend here uh, because I think quantum teleportation was covered. Can anyone tell me, should I cover quantum teleportation or uh, that's not necessary? Hello? Hello? Okay. Since there was uh, nothing... Uh, oh, so I will continue. Okay, okay. So, uh, um, so quantum teleportation, as I said about the quantum satellite experiment of Jan Y. Pan, the most important thing they showed was they could teleport a unknown state of a qubit to this Mikios, their quantum, their satellite, 1400 kilometers orbiting the Earth. <laughs> now, the first step in this is, <clears throat> and why quantum teleportation is so unique is that Classically, you can clone or you can copy any state. For example, I have a zero classical state. I can make hundred and thousand of copies of that state. But quantumly, you cannot copy an unknown quantum state. That is fundamentally illegal. So that is called the no cloning theorem. An unknown quantum state cannot be cloned by any unitary transformation. Since all quantum operations have to be unitary, you cannot copy an unknown quantum state. But you can teleport it. So we'll explain how to teleport it. So let's say, let's, uh, so, so we'll prove this theorem by negative. That means let's assume that there is some unitary operator which can do it. It can copy a quantum state. So you have a, a two qubit state. The first qubit is in state phi. The second qubit is a blank state. There is nothing there. And say I run my unitary operator on this phi and this blank state and I get two copies of my qubit phi phi. Now let's do the same thing with two arbitrary states. Let there be phi and another qubit state phi. Um, so this is a um, uh, phi and this you can say is a script phi. So it's a slightly different kind of phi. So, the, um, so what we do is we again run them. So this is now a unitary operator and the same property it uh, takes phi zero to phi phi. So similarly, it will take script phi to script phi, script phi. So it clones, it copies your single qubit state to two copies. Now let's take a superposition of this phi and psi, <coughs> which is this psi, phi and script phi, sorry, a equal superposition, which we call psi. And now I again run this u on psi and a blank state. There is nothing in the second qubit state. So you run u on phi zero plus u or script phi zero, you open it up. So you have phi phi plus script phi script phi by root two. So this is the output. What about, but 
you can also run only on psi and zero and it will give you psi psi. So what about that? So psi psi is what? Phi phi plus phi script phi plus script phi phi plus phi script phi script phi equals to position of all this. But we see this final state differs from the previous state. This one, phi phi plus script phi script phi by root two. So the same unitary operator acting on the same quantum state is giving two different results. That means this unitary operator does not exist. So by negative, we have proved that such kind of uh, cloning operation is not at all possible. So what do we do in quantum teleportation? So we have a unknown quantum state. We have two people, Alice and Bob, who share a maximally entangled state, which is a Bell state, which is five plus. And through classical channel, say a telephone, <clears throat> which Alice and Bob share, the idea is to uh, teleport the quantum state, which is with Alice, to Bob, okay, via classical channels and this entangled state which Alice and Bob share, okay. So Alice is a qubit whose state she does not know. She wishes to send Bob the quantum state of this qubit through a classical communication channel. The unknown state is completely arbitrary. It has an amplitude A before sitting before zero and an amplitude B before one. Now, they share this entangled state phi plus, which is a bell state, maximally entangled state, 0, 0 plus 1, 1. So it's an equal superposition of 0, 0 and 1, 1 states. Now, let's see. Now, initially, we have the phi and this phi plus, the bell state in a product. So we have three qubit state, A with this entangled state, uh, 0, 0 plus 1. So let's open it up and we write it explicitly. So we have A000 plus A011 plus B100 plus B11. So it's a three qubit state now. And the amplitudes A and B are now across all the states. Now Alice has access to the unknown state and one of the qubits of the entangled state. So the, on the first two qubits she has access to, Bob has access to the third qubit state. Okay, now Alice, what she does is first <clears throat> does a U C naught. So she applies the C naught gate on her two qubits. After she applies the C naught gate on her two qubits, she then applies the Hadamard gate on the first qubit. So these are the two operations she did. She does. Now, if you apply the C naught gate on the two qubits, we have seen what does the C naught gate do. So C naught gate, we go back. <clears throat> it's here. So C naught gate, if you apply 0, 0, it will give you 0, 0. If you 0, 1, it gives you 0, 1. If it is 1, 0, it gives you 1, 1. That means if the control, so C naught means the first qubit is control, the second qubit is target. Okay. And this is the uh, matrix for that. So if the first qubit control is 1, then it flips the target bit. So if it is 0, it will make it 1. So similarly, here it is 1, 1. The uh, control bit is 1. So target bit will be flipped. So 1, it is 0. If the control bit is 0, nothing happens to the target bit. OK? <clears throat> and Hadamard, we know Hadamard takes a qubit and makes it into a superposition. 0 into a superposition of 0 plus 1 state, and 1 into a superposition of 0 minus 1. OK? So uh, Alice does that. First, she does the C0 on her two qubits and then does Hadamard on the first qubit. And at the end, what we have is the first two qubits are, can be written in just the computational basis, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1. <coughs> what she does then is she measures the two qubits that are with her. Now, when she measures it, she will get either of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, dot one one with equal probability say one four and bob's qubit will then instantaneously will collapse when she does a measurement bob's qubit when she does a measurement on these two qubits bob qubit will instantaneously collapse to this state or this state or this state or this state now you know the initial state of the qubit was a zero plus b one <coughs> now what does alice after the measurement does is she tells 
what results she got. If she conveys that I got the result 0, 0, then Bob does it nothing to his state because it is automatically in the A0 plus B1 state, which is the unknown state. If Alice says she got 0, 1, then Bob does a exchange gate. When you do exchange gate, you just flip it. So A1 plus B0 will go to A0 plus B1. You just exchange the states of the 0 and 1. If she, Alice says it's 1, 0, then she, Bob does a Z. So it puts a different phase. This is a phase change. A0 minus B1 goes to A0 plus B1. And if it's 1, 1, she does both a phase change as well as an exchange. Both Y, which is a product of X and Z. Okay. So by doing this, Bob can reconstruct the unknown quantum state. So unknown quantum state, which was with Alice, has now traveled and now is with Bob. So that is the magic of quantum teleportation. So here is the quantum circuit, which does it. So you have first a Hadamard, uh, and then you have these two uh, C0 Sir, gates. Can you explain it again? Sir. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, Sir, can I, you explain uh, okay. Alice and Bob? Huh. Uh -huh. So this I thought uh, quantum teleportation would have been covered. So okay, I am explaining it again. So um, um, actually, if I was in person, I could have solved it in the blackboard. But by talk, it is a bit... Uh, Okay, let me try it again. Okay. So we saw that Alice and Bob share an entangled state, maximally entangled state, which is 5 plus. 0, 0 plus 1, 1 equals superposition of 0, 0 and 1, 1. Why maximally entangled state? Say I measure the first qubit and it is 0. Without measuring the second qubit, I will get to know that the second qubit is in 0 state. Okay, so that, the, um, that means it is maximally entangled. Yes. Okay. yes. Okay, so now what we have is all the three qubits are in this state. The first unknown qubit is phi, this phi, and the maximally entangled state is this capital phi plus. Okay, so A0 tensor product with 0, 0 plus 1, 1 plus B1 tensor product with 0, 0 plus 1. Okay, so this is your unknown state phi, and this is a product state with the maximally entangled states of your qubit, two qubits, which are shared by Alice and Bob. So the first uh, qubit of this maximally entangled state is shared by Alice. Second qubit is with Bob. And Alice also has an unknown state, this 0 and 1. Okay? Is this clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So now I can open it up. So we have three qubits and you can write, so this, this tensor product is actually over here also, zero tensor zero. But uh, to save space, I'm not writing it. So it's zero, 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 okay? So it's A, okay. zero, 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 plus A, zero, one, one, plus B, one, zero. So I've just written it explicitly. So Alice now has access to her entangled qubit, the part she has, and the phi state, okay? So what she does is she does two things. First, she does a UC knot on her two qubits, the control knot. And then she does the Hadamard on the first qubit only. Okay. So on her two qubits, she will do C naught. So if she does C naught on 0, 0, your outcome would be 0, 0. If she does C naught on 0, 1, outcome will again be 0, 1 because the control bit is 0. Nothing happens to the target bit. Hmm. Uh, now, when she does C naught on one zero, there is a change because one zero will give rise to one one. One one. After doing C naught, and B one one will give rise to one zero. One zero. Hmm. Yeah. After that, she does U Hadamard on the first qubit on zero. So zero will give you plus state. So that becomes zero plus one by root two. By Same root. thing, 0 plus 1 by root 2. Now, this state is no longer 1, 0, but it is 0, 1. Huh. Because C naught has already huh. been huh. active. Zero so, one. this 0 is now again 0 plus 1 by root 2. And this one is again 0 minus 1 by root 2. Okay. So, I have now not shown all the steps here. There are two, three steps in between here. So I have written directly the result. So when you do those things, you finally end up with this. 
a 0 0 0 plus 0 1 1 plus 1 0 0 plus 1 1 1 plus b this okay there are two uh, lines of calculation between this step and this step which i have omitted which is very trivial actually so anyone can do it so but if you want i can explicitly do no, it and send it you. to you it's okay 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 fine so then we have these state this is the final state after doing scene of the first two qubits and hadamard on the first qubit first okay okay so now alice we know has access to one entangled qubit and one unknown qubit this phi state and one qubit from this phi plus okay so what she does she can write this as zero zero take this zero zero common zero zero when she takes common so this zero zero is here this zero zero he takes common so what is left with is a zero on the third qubit a zero plus b1 okay a0 plus b1 same thing she takes 0 1 common so 0 1 she takes common here 0 and there is again a 0 1 here so 0 1 when she takes common what we have it is a1 plus b0 hmm. okay yes. and then when she takes 1 0 common from here 1 0 here what we have here 1 0 when one she zero. takes common 1 0 which is a0 Minus and uh, minus B1. B1. One. One. Uh. Yeah. And finally, when she takes one one common here, she is left with A0 <coughs> minus B0. Minus okay. B zero. Huh. That's it. So she has now taken uh, written it in terms of four computational basis states: 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay. Yes, sir. And the third qubit is in either of these four states. Now, what she does, she measures her two qubits. Okay. Okay. Now, when she makes a measurement, she will get either 0, 0 or 0, 1 or 1, 0 or 1, 1 with equal probability. Why equal probability? Because it is half. See, this uh, half is everywhere. Half, 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 half. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, so. Um, amplitude is half, so probability would be 1 by 4. Amplitude mod square is probability, right? Huh. Yes, sir. So she gets with one fourth probability either 0, 0, or 0, 1, or 1, 0, or 1. Now, if she gets 0, 0, that means Bob's qubit is in this state A0 plus B1. So Bob all already has the unknown qubit with himself. So he doesn't have to do anything. Third qubit always was always with Bob, right? Third qubit mm -hmm. was with Bob. So mm -hmm. she, Bob doesn't have to do so. After making the measurement, Alice tells Bob that I got this measurement outcome. She will get one of these, either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1 with equal probability, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4. Mm -hmm. So let's say she gets 0, 0, and she tells Bob that I got 0, 0. Then Bob automatically knows that his qubit would be in the state A0 plus B1, which was the unknown state. So he yes. doesn't have to do anything. Hmm. So Bob doesn't have to do anything. He knows that the state was 0, 0. Uh, the early state is 0, 0. So he has the unknown state with him. So the unknown state, which was with Alice, after all these steps, a C0 and a Hadamard and a measurement is now completely with Bob, A0 plus B1. Now let's say Alice gets 0, 1. If Alice gets 0, 1, that means Bob's state is A1 plus B0. Yes. But A1 plus B0 is different from the initial phi. We saw the initial phi was A0 plus B1. So how to get that phi? To do that phi, you have to operate X. X is the exchange gate. It exchanges um, what was only... with 1, yeah, poly X, exactly, mm -hmm. poly X. Mm -hmm. So poly X acting on A plus B0 will give you A0 plus B1. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. Okay, similarly, if it is 1, 0, Bob uh, will do a Z operation mm -hmm. on his qubit, or if it is mm -hmm. 1, 1, he will do a Y operation on his qubit. Okay? And by okay. this, he will get back the phi state. Mm -hmm. Exactly the unknown state which was with Alice. 
so this is the principle of quantum teleportation which was shown uh, first by the zeilinger group over 143 kilometers by optical fibers they showed it and then by these chinese people from earth to a satellite which is orbiting the earth at distance of 1400 kilometers okay mm -hmm. yes sir Thank okay you. so this is the quantum so, so so this is the quantum circuit to show that phi is the unknown state initially you have zero zero you have a hadamard and a c not gate you make a entangled state and this entangled state the second and the third bits of the entangled state are shared by alice and bob alice has the second qubit bob has the third qubit alice has access to the first qubit also first alice does is a c not on the first two qubits then does a hadamard then makes the measurement this uh, emitter like setting with pointer is a measures the first two qubits she gets either of these 000110 and then via telephone she conveys that to bob then bob does a unitary operator on his third qubit and back the state phi so the third qubit state is now the phi state and it is now with bob so what was with alice has been reproduced to be with bob okay okay actually i have, i think i have completely run out of time it is 1121 and uh, so these are some re remarks on um, super teleportation it is not super luminal process is not instantaneous as a classical channel is involved so you have to convey alice conveys to bob that uh, this measurements i got so depending on the speed of your telecommunication that would be the speed of your quantum teleportation process now application to cryptography the information of alpha and beta has gone through the quantum channel but not by a classical channel so if somebody wants to hack the information he has to hack the quantum channel and if you hack quantum channel you destroy the state so therefore it is there has lot of applications in quantum cryptography so what is transferred is the classical information sends two bits of information to bob uh, what is transferred only the measurement outcomes and not alpha and beta are transferred by the classical channel no cloning is in violated phi is destroyed at the state of alice and created at bob said and the resource required is both quantum and classical and both alice and bob no, need not know alpha and beta so that unknown state which was with alice is now with bob but apart from that they don't know what is in alpha and beta what are the amplitudes alpha and beta they have no idea okay so this was first proposed in the theory paper in prl and later it was done in experiment <laughs> okay so now to move on we have seen some single and two qubit gates the other gate which is very much essential for quantum circuits is called the swap gates like nand nor and are all irreversible if you cannot get the output from the input that means they generate heat all quantum gates are reversible that means they don't generate heat from the output you can know what was the input okay <coughs> so like this you have three qubit gates these are called the toffoli and fredkin gates and um, so i'm not skipping all this so i wanted to spend the last few minutes on the design of a superconducting qubit which is very essential because so i actually um, had uh, wrote a theory paper on designing a graphene josephson qubit which was very well received by the physics community and it was built on a graphene ring and it was a superconducting josephson junction qubit and um, whatever qubits now you see with uh, this um, google sycamore or ibm they are just versions of the superconducting qubit they also use josephson junctions they also use superconductors so they are not exactly same as what i will describe but they are related to it so if you understand this this is what i would call a superconducting flux qubit if you understand this you will be able to understand those qubits as well okay so this was very well received this was published in this fizrev b paper so we have a graphene ring and we have two parts one is one just kind of josephson junction which is called zero junction and in the bottom half another kind of josephson junction which is called the josephson pi junction so we link two josephson junctions and design this qubit 
So there have been earlier proposals as well. So this was uh, um, some material on that. So earlier people have used graphene to design spin qubits. In fact, now also there is a company called Intel. I didn't say much about it. Intel is designing spin qubits, quantum computer based on spin qubits. And this is also a very uh, interesting technology. Um, so just uh, watch out. They may come up with their graphene spin qubit, not graphene, sorry, their quantum spin qubit computer very soon. That is based on quantum dots, not graphene. So uh, on uh, graphene, we had uh, proposed this uh, superconducting qubit. Now, there was an earlier proposal using graphene spin qubits, and that was to couple spins in quantum dots. But there is no, ex the graphene has a problem, there is no band gap. So it's very difficult to control electrons in graphene. So, but our proposal, which is based on Jefferson effect, uh, doesn't need any uh, band gaps in graphene for this to fructify. So we know what is the Jefferson effect. So Jefferson effect was proposed by Brian Jefferson and in um, 1970, and that shows that if two superconductors are separated by an insulator or normal metal, then the superconducting wave functions tunnel through the normal metal into the other superconductor. And if you maintain the two superconductors at a specific phase difference, then you will have a supercurrent through the normal metal. And that is called the Josephson effect. That supercurrent is sinusoidal in the phase difference. So what does a superconductor mean? Superconductor mean all the quasicles, they all coalesce and form a big state, a quantum macroscopic state with millions of Cooper pairs, all having the uh, same wave function, this capital psi, and they are flowing with a specific, and they are identified with a specific phase and a specific magnitude. This psi, this more absolute value of psi is the, what is called the band gap, and phi is the superconducting phase wave function. Now, if you calculate the free energy of such a Jefferson junction, then it is as a global minimum at phi equals to zero. Uh, you can design another kind of Jefferson junction if you will have ferromagnets in between the superconductors, and that's called a Jefferson phi junction. That means the ground state shifts from a zero to a pi. So in a zero junction, your ground state, as you see here, is at phi zero. And in a pi junction, your ground state has shifted from zero to plus or minus pi. Okay, so that's the only difference. <clears throat> now, our idea is to have a zero junction in a pi junction and thereby create a doubly degenerate ground state, which will act as our zero and one state. And by arbitrarily changing either the gate voltage or the flux, we can make different kinds of superpositions of this zero and one state. So that's the idea of this superconducting Josephson qubit. So advantage of this is there is no ferromagnet, only with graphene and with a gate voltage we can do it. So this is the theory, you write the wave functions on both sides of the superconductor, and then you by detailed balance calculate the Josephson current. I don't go much into the theory, but it is simple. And then then you can see that in our superconducting calculation, depending on the length of the intervening normal metal, you have, this is the graphene layer, I mean, and on the other side, there are superconductors on graphene. So you have different lengths. There is a change in the Jefferson current. So here is the Jefferson current and here is the free energy. So the red lines are for the um, pi junction for which the ground state is at phi equals to pi and the black um, solid line is for the uh, free energy for the ground state at phi equals to zero. Okay, so you have at a um, Fermi energy of 100, a ground state at uh, phi equals to zero and at a Fermi energy of 2000, these are in units of the superconducting gap, the free energy at pi. Now you have two different ground states and the idea is to integrate these two ground states. So one could be your zero state, the other could be your one state and you integrate this state to form your superposition uh, qubit. Okay. So what we do is we minimize and find the net ground state after we integrate the two systems, the zero junction and the pi junction. And here you have the uh, zero and 
one state. So the zero state, what we call, is that I have a flux at three pi by five, which is here, and the uh, one state is at seven pi by five, and between them they have a massive barrier. This ma barrier is the difference in uh, the ratio of energies of the zero and pi junction, and as I said, this can be controlled by the gate voltage, very easily controlled by the gate voltage, or you can also control it by a external flux. So you have seen. How by external flux or by the gate voltage you can control this tunneling parameter. So uh, let's say you start and localize, initialize the system at say this phi uh, pi is three pi by five, which is your zero state. Then by changing alpha, you can reduce alpha, and then you can uh, achieve tunneling between this state and one state, or you can put them in equal to position. By changing flux, sign of the flux, you can manipulate these two states, zero and one, and make either completely in zero state or completely in one state or arbitrary superposition of zero and one. Either by a gate voltage or by external flux, you can do it. So you can implement, say, a phase gate in say some picoseconds. Very fast, you can implement a phase gate. Just puts a phase between the zero and one state. You can get an exchange gate. That is what I was discussing earlier. The Sigma x gate, you can do it in say around 10 to the power minus four seconds, which is once again milliseconds. So you can exchange the amplitudes of zero and one, and we showed that here. So basically, uh, a superconducting qubits are formed by integrating Josephson junctions, zero and pi junctions you couple, and then you integrate them, and then by either controlling by gate voltage or external magnetic flux, you control the populations of these zero and one states. And then design qubits. I gave you examples of one qubit gates. One is the sigma x gate, the exchange gate, and the phase gate. You can also build two qubit gates, but that would go beyond this talk. Uh, actually, I have no time now. I think to cover decoherence and uh, other things. Uh, so decoherence is the real problem with uh, quantum bits uh, qubits. Um, uh, I have uh, some uh, much material on that, but to uh, Um, make you understand decoherence. I have to uh, introduce density matrices and all, which will take some time. I don't want to do that now, but um, maybe in, uh, next time, if I'm given a chance, I will focus mainly on decoherence. And then I wanted to speak something on error correction, because unless uh, you have uh, error correction for qubits, because qubits. So sorry to disturb you. Yeah. Uh, so could you just introduce what is that decoherence? Which one? Oh, decoherence is the loss of phase coherence. So here, uh, let me start then uh, and try to explain. Okay. So if you when you write, so only you introduce the, just uh, just introduce not much only introduction. That's it. Uh, okay. So um, um, so um, um, uh, decoherence means loss of phase coherence. So when I uh, when we give examples, this a zero plus b one say. So this is the arbitrary superposition of two qubits. Now, if this qubit um, goes to a classical state, that means it loses phase coherence. So this arbitrary superposition a and b, which are there with amplitude, will go to either a becomes one, that means it is only in the classical state zero, or b becomes one, that is in the classical state one. That is actually decoherence. That it is lo lost its phase superposition. So when a qubit loses its superposition, that means it is decoherent. It has decohered and it has become just a classical bit. So the uh, transition from a qubit, which is a say a equal superposition of zero and one, which is fifty <clears> percent <throat> probability to be found in zero state, fifty percent probability to be found in one state, to a state where it is hundred percent found in zero or hundred percent found in one state. Is called decoherence, the loss of phase coherence in a qubit. Okay, sir, and that's right. Thank you so much. Okay, so I wanted to say something about decoherence in detail, but um, time prevents me. Um, but um, uh, then there is error correction. Um, decoherence will always be there for superconducting qubits because when you are measuring and doing operations, when you are coupling, the qubits can decohere by coupling to the environment. So to you. Obviate that, or to overcome that, you have to have some error correction protocols. So, what are error correction protocols? Instead of uh, having a single qubit 
uh, encode information, you have more number of qubits encode information, such that if something happens to one of them, the majority, via majority rule, you can still find out that uh, the information has gone through. So it's like uh, classical error correction, but it's also a different to classical error correction. So it's called quantum error correction. And by this, for example, uh, three qubits, if there are some bit flips or phase flips, you can always do error correction for them. Um, so this is also possible. Okay. So the IBM Quantum One system, which they are developing, they don't uh, already have quantum error correction protocols completely. So they are still single qubit systems coupled to make uh, quantum gates. But in future, when they go to say 1,000 qubits, they are saying that they will build complete error correction protocols. <coughs> so when you build error correction protocols, it massively scales up your system. So instead of a single qubit, we have now five qubits to take care of error correction. So that means a lot of ancillary qubits have to be uh, added to your system. The complexity of your system uh, increases manifold, but then your information is protected and your uh, computation can run for longer and longer time. Okay. So with this, I would like to end. I would like to thank Professor Panda for giving me this opportunity. Um, and um, I hope uh, you all learned something. Sir, you okay, were talking about you. the Josephson uh, that, uh, could you go back to the previous slide, okay. sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Josephson Junction, okay. Yes, Josephson Junction. Yes, yes. This one, sir. This yeah, yeah. Uh, superconducting uh, graphene. Actually, yeah. uh, I I actually didn't understand uh, how it works. Uh, means what? Uh, yeah. means there are two uh, normal graphenes, and uh, this yeah, is yeah. angle, isn't it? Is it angle phi? No, no. Phi yeah. actually is a superconducting phase. Um, phase between yeah, superconducting phase. And um, there is also an external flux, which is that I actually couldn't uh, explain completely in detail. Mm -hmm. So phi, as mm -hmm. I said before here, phi here you see phi mm -hmm. is the superconducting phase. Okay. So as you are uh, taking this sine of uh, sine of phi or cosine of phi, so it is representing that uh, this is going in uh, sinusoidal form or cosinusoidal form. So, which is representing yeah, yeah. that this is going in an angular form, isn't it, sir? Uh, uh, well, uh, let me explain it better, maybe. Uh, so, what is happening? <laughs> I'm so here? sorry, sir. Uh, okay. but, uh, it's not clear to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. I went uh, rushed through this. So, um, so Josephson um, <coughs> effect uh, uh, to summarize: if you have two superconductors. <laughs> And um, if there is a superconductor here on the left with some phase phi, and on the right, say, there is another superconductor of the same material, say, S-wave superconductors on either side, and there is uh, some phase difference of phi, and, and it is at a phase zero, say, then the phase difference across the super two superconductors is phi, right? Phi minus zero, which is phi. Yes, okay. sir. So mm -hmm. if, the, um, if the, such a situation exists, then the prediction by Josephson was that a supercurrent can flow from the left superconductor to the right superconductor because of this phase difference alone. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you don't need a voltage. So you yeah. don't need, so it's an equilibrium current which flows from the left superconductor to the right superconductor in absence of any external applied electric field or voltage so that is a very very big thing so you don't as because there is the magnetism it. isn't it sir no here because there is no magnet here there then is how, just a how is it button. possible sir so the possibility is because there are this is a one wave function which describes the superconductor and this mm -hmm. quantum wave function can tunnel through the normal metal into the other superconductor Okay. okay sir. And when okay, both sir. of these two superconductors that tunnel across each other, these two superconducting wave functions can quantum interfere. And because of that interference, they can sustain an equilibrium current so sustained by a phase difference mm -hmm. across the two superconductors. Okay. Uh, 
uh, is it okay yes sir yes sir okay okay so uh, super current flows now this super current when it flows if uh, the super current as i said has um, a minima at phi equal to 0 that at phi equals to 0 there is no super current that means the free energy has a ground state at phi equals to 0 as you see here which is called a zero junction and when uh, you can build also another super current um, so now understood sir yes. yes sir understood so can, thank you so yes. much sir <laughs> okay fine So actually i was not getting the the main thing how that um, without the voltage how uh, it is creating the okay. it is creating current so th that okay. was the confusion thank you so much sir okay okay i understand that it was too much actually lot of things to cover the because the topic is so vast progress and yes sir Uh, and so, so if you don't question. mind uh, give us the some some ppts or a pdf which is, which uh, which shows the detail uh, information of all these uh, basics so it yeah. will uh, much better for us okay okay i will uh, share my pdf file i will send it to professor panda and in okay, that sir. form um, pdf file uh, i have given some references uh, especially in the beginning of the talk i gave some references of some Articles, very popular science articles, published okay. either in archive or in New York Times. This, um, um, which are oh, completely for the public, actually, but they are very easily understandable. Uh, uh, so, and it will be much so, better for us if you give your email ID or any contact, uh, so that uh, yeah, yeah, we can my, contact you if you we have any issues. Yeah, yeah, my, my email ID is on the first page here, Colin dot Nano at Gmail dot com. If you have any. um questions or queries about the talk or any reference you need so just you know, send me an email and i will uh, send you that material okay sir thank you so much sir okay, okay. so any other questions thank you very much sir for being with us and sparing your valuable time and giving the deep insights on quantum computing that we look forward to well uh, for the this kind of ftp again sir thank you very much sir okay, okay. thank you so much for your time i am sorry i couldn't cover um, the whole of the thing because the topic is very vast challenges and progress is so vast and so much is happening uh, means uh, it's so exciting and uh, actually i am also learning means the um, the progress is so fast that it is leaving all of us behind so uh, means uh, yesterday we knew about guy google psychomer and now this chinese people have come up with a boson sampling quantum computer which is 79 qubits built from photons and it is uh, mind boggles how, how fast the technology is progressing so um, thank you for so much for your time and for giving me this opportunity again thank you thank you sir so i'll now leave yes sir yes sir uh, okay okay so i'm stopping sharing and Dear now participants I'm... kindly fill the attendance which has been for, uh, shared in the chat window Yes. kindly join for the next session exactly at 12 okay. thank you so much bye <laughs> thank you sir